we, you're Arch in Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. And we will be doing lots of politics and really public policy. Perhaps public policy more than politics, because we have John Tillman. He is the C CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute. His specialty is policy. For 30 years, he was slaving away in business, figuring out how to do successful things, how to make money for people and himself, sales, marketing. And then for the last five years or so, he's been focusing on developing a coherent set of principles at the Illinois Policy Institute, which is an economic liberty and free market-based think tank. Would that be correct? John? That'd be very much correct, yes. OK. And so you know, the thing that's on, we're taping this show on September 23rd. And John and I have talked a lot before about pensions and pension reform. And so people might be wondering, as we approach the November 6th election, well, did somebody get something done on pension reform? And if they didn't, will they pay? That would be a logical thing if we were talking about a, a private sector decision. Because if somebody screws up in the private sector, they pay, I think. And secondly, we'll be talking about the, the teachers' union and CPS. CPS, Chicago Public School System, CTU, Chicago Teachers' Union. They struck. There was a deal. Was it good for society? And third, we may be talking about Romney and, uh, and Obama. So this show has every element of good public policy and good politics in it. And so, John, tell us, will there be any pension reform passed before November 6th? Because that's the election. And if not, she knows something about politics as well. Will there be, how, what's the expression, hell to pay because they didn't get it done? No, first of all, nothing will be passed before November 6th. Uh, both caucuses, uh, both parties in both chambers are extremely focused on November 6th, not on passing legislation. And no, I don't think there'll be a political price to pay uh, in terms of uh, the General Assembly races uh, for not having passed pension reform this cycle. And uh, I think the first chance we're going to see some material reform start to get some life will be in January. Not even, well, will it be in the lame duck session before the new folks come in? So it'll be the January lame duck session before the new folks, state reps, state senators are inaugurated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's when yeah, we'll Yeah, well, the, 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 the January 2011 tax hike, as you might remember, the $7 billion tax hike passed uh, in a straight party line vote with uh, the Democrat majority controlling. Uh, that was passed in lame duck session, literally as it ran. As so a lot of Dems could take the vote, and then the Dem party wouldn't be penalized, or they wouldn't be penalized. But why would the Democratic Party be penalized? If, if as you say, people are so concerned about taxes, that's what you say, and your organization. That's not. Those are your words. I haven't said that exactly. Oh, well, w would you say your organization, the LNA Policy Institute, takes a strong stand, sort of the Grover Norquist stand? that tax hikes should never be permitted. Pretty much, yes, that's okay. true. But that's different than the way you characterized it. We, well, we, what, what people are focused on is the complete collapse of Illinois' economic competitiveness, of which tax policy and spending policy are both a part of, along with our regulatory scheme that penalizes okay. entrepreneurs, investors, and workers. And the reason the Democrats won't pay a price in, on November 6th is because the public is generally focused on the economy more broadly, job creation specifically, and pensions, uh, I think, are just not going to rise to the level during a presidential year. People are going to be focused on the presidential year. Well, is the economy in Illinois good? No, the economy in Illinois is horrible. Is it uh, worse than it is on average throughout the country? Yes, our, un our unemployment rate is above the national average, and in 2011... What is we, it roughly in Illinois? Uh, about 8.3%, I think it it's is. It's 8.1% nationally, so it's not so different. No, but in Chicago, it's 10.5%, and the bottom line is that in 2011, Illinois had the worst unemployment growth in the entire country. That, of course, comes on the heels of having passed that tax hike. The worst unemployment growth, you mean? And there's unemployment's well, been falling, but at a slower rate yes, than I have it has four, in the four, In 2011, four states had their unemployment rates rise. We were one of those, and ours rose the most by 0.8%. In what and month was that? This was in the entire year of 2011. Okay. And uh, the rest of the, I think 44 states had their unemployment decline. So at a time when nationally 44 states and the overall trend line was downward unemployment, uh, Illinois led the country in upward that unemployment. That was 2011, and that 2011, followed the right. big $6 billion tax increase. That's right. That occurred in 
and December we, of 2010 or January? January, January 2011, 2011, 2011 was the tax hike, and 2012 has not been much better. Do you see a correlation there between that $6 billion Of course I do. The anecdotal increase. evidence is overwhelming as well as the, uh, the statistical evidence that is now accumulating is that people, for many people, that tax hike in January of 2011 uh, was the last straw. Many people are now changing their residency, and we're going to see as the data comes in over time a tremendous number of people, particularly upper income people, relocating their residencies to states that are more friendly to them. And in 2012, what's the performance been like? I haven't Illinois looked at, relative I, frankly, I haven't looked at 2012 real closely, we but we've not, we've not done well. Well, I get to decide what I should do, Jeff, and it's been very busy. <laughs> I've got a lot on my plate. <laughs> well, because, I because you're running for governor, I understand, because you're oh, running I, for governor yes, no, and you're CEO you, of the only Ponce Institute. Yeah, if, folks, yeah. if you're running for governor and you're running a major organization that's, what, $3.5 billion, Of course, billion, your, your viewers should know, you know, you have to actually be quiet for a minute and let me get this out. Of course, I am not running for governor. That's just, governor. that's just the way you like to stir the pot. No, I'm uh, not running for governor. Maybe you should. There are many rumors to that effect, but I have no intention of running for governor. I, would you I, I think you would give it some thought? Uh, everybody that's ever been in public policy or politics always thinks about those things. Okay. I think I can serve the movement for the free market system and capitalism and liberty much better doing what I'm doing now, and so I'm not going to run for governor in 2014. You heard it, heard it here first. Oh, so you're closing the door. You're saying unequivocally you will not run. If people show up at your doorstep and they say, John, you've got to do it. You're the great man. You're the best person to do this. If a lot of supporters, a lot of funders, a lot of there are many other people that if they all say that, just let me get the question out. If they all do I'm that, waiting. you're saying you're closing the door. It's unequivocal. You will not run for governor in the state of Illinois in 2014, no matter what. That is the correct answer. Okay. Well, there you go. All those rumors. Everybody, everybody. It's really fascinating to me how people want to try to figure out what one's agenda is. My agenda has been very transparent from the very beginning. I want to see Illinois rise and become the economic powerhouse it should be. Because when it does that, prosperity returns for everybody, not just the uh, middle class, not just the affluent, but especially the poor and disadvantaged. And I believe that the greatest force for good ever created in the human sphere is the free market system, and it's the best way to help the poor and disadvantaged rather than the cycle of dependency and expanding government power to try to draw more people into government programs forever. And so there are very few people who want to do that and focus on the policy and the grassroots work that I do. There's lots of people who are very qualified to run for governor. So is that what uh, Mitt Romney was saying when he was speaking to the funders and no, the comment I think that came out no, last week and no. he talked about 47%? And he said, you know, these are the 47 percent. He said, folks, they're the folks who don't pay income taxes. Uh, they're get, they feel they're entitled to housing, to health care, to everything. He said, there's nothing I can do. I'm paraphrasing, but this is essentially what he said. He didn't know he was being recorded. He thought he was talking to friends and so forth. And in a sense, folks, he was saying what almost every pundit says. 47 percent of the country is strongly in Barack Obama's corner. 47 percent or so. Actually, they say 44 percent strongly in Obama's corner, 44 percent strongly in Romney's corner, and there's 10 to 12 percent that are undecided. Well, the era, and the, almost every pundit says it. Now, he embellished it with a few statements that hurt him a little bit. The but era, essentially, are, are you saying that Romney got that wrong, that it wasn't just impolitic, but it was also incorrect? Uh, it was definitely incorrect. The, the whole point of our, uh, our philosophy is uh, that the progressive agenda, the liberal agenda, tries to expand government power and have further and further expansion of uh, programs. And I mean, think about it. The whole idea is to draw ever more people into government dependency for their food, their shelter, their clothing, uh, their education, and now their health care. Uh, that is, a, I, I, in my view, immoral to draw people into government dependency. The liberty agenda is to empower people to pursue their dreams. The progressive agenda is to empower government over people. This is an outrageous uh, Isn't that approach. what Romney said? So what did he get wrong? That is not at all what Romney well, what did, said. What, what did he get wrong? Well, if you let me say? complete the thought, I will, I will actually complete oh, the thought. Sure. What Romney missed is that just because some people are part of the 47 percent who don't pay taxes does not mean they don't have the aspiration to live the American dream and become self-reliant and pursue greatness. And that's what he should have said. And the, and the whole point of you're going to be a missionary for the liberty movement, and in his case, the Republican uh, nominee, you should be going to those 47 percent and trying to convert them to your cause rather than writing them off. And that was his mistake. And I think he knows that. And I think he'll do better next time. OK. And have you ever talked with Mitt Romney? Uh, I've met him a couple of times. He wouldn't know me from Adam, however. Do you think, you know, that people say the problem, and we're sort of reversing this, folks, as we always, you know, follow a somewhat unscripted view. <laughs> right, John? That's always, it's always fun to see how it goes. All right. Well, actually, <laughs> I like John it. Calloway, uh, you know, the great John Calloway, he used to do Chicago at Night on Channel 11. I once asked him, Mr. Calloway, what's the secret to a good interview with an Australian? And he said, Jeff, start with a script, and if the guest gets engaged, throw away the script.
Well, John, you're definitely engaged, so we tossed out I'm the I'm always engaged on your show. Okay. So, now I forgot where I was. Okay, so, the, 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 thing, the thing of it is here, so you've spoken with Rami, and a lot of people say there's no there there. You know, they, you know, he's changed his position on a number of social issues over the years, and they just get the view that it's, this is not like a Ronald Reagan. This is not a guy where you can sense what his core free market ideas are. His, 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 he espouses free market views. He generally talks the game of saying we should lower taxes, lower spending, have less regulation, and have a freer country, economic freedom, political freedom, and so forth. So he says the right things, but maybe it's the lack of passion. Maybe I don't agree with that at all. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. I've met him a couple of times. I've found him to be a very warm and charming person. I okay. think he has, is deeply passionate about this country. I think he's deeply passionate about the free market system. I think the challenge is his life experiences in the business life that he's done. And people who've lived a life think a certain way and they communicate very cautiously. And a politician, uh, you know, to be a, an effective persuader of the electorate, uh, you have to sort of let it go. It's sort of like uh, in sports. You, know, you have to get in the zone. Think about Michael Jordan during the great years getting in the zone and just letting it flow. He has a hard time letting it flow because his nature, his life's training is to be cautious. But in his soul, I think he's a good person. Is he a true believer in this in the way that I would like? I don't know. I don't I don't know that I'm qualified to answer yeah. that. But I, I think in the in the end it really comes down to can he make the sale compared to what the alternative is? Of course the alternative is President Obama's, in my view, uh, agenda of American decay and decline. Yeah, but you know, is is you said his training the way he was sort of grew up doesn't let him let it go. Uh, is that I, was, the, I was referring to his business That's life. what I'm saying, that's yeah. the business training. Because the thing of it is here, this is what people might say, the pundits, but he, he ran for the U.S. Senate in Massachusetts, I think in 94, against Ted Kennedy, or thereabouts. And then he ran for governor and won in 2002, I believe, that's in Massachusetts. Right. And then he ran for president in 2006, didn't win, but you know. So he's been doing politics now for almost 20 years, maybe longer. Isn't it time? Shouldn't he get it? Because if he doesn't get it now, how's he going to adapt to the presidency? I no, mean, this is, this is no, the, people, this is the question this I think that people are asking. Why he has terrible, his unfavorables swamp his favorables. You know Well, that. there's a host of reasons why. why, I mean, this, why is a, is this, is, this is a big conversation, but the, but, yeah. the, but the whole point is, the real question is, why is he not as an effective campaigner as he could be? Right. Why is he not as an why effective uh, communicator and marketer of his, his personal brand and yeah. his vision? Because that's just not his skill set. That's not what he's particularly good at. But would he be a good president is a different question. Reverse, the, reverse this. Barack Obama is an excellent campaigner. He is an excellent guy who's created a brand identity for himself, and he is very skilled, as we're seeing now, despite all the challenges that this president has in terms of the economic data, in terms of the foreign policy problems, he is starting to edge ahead at the, at the time we're taping this show. Who's starting to edge ahead? Barack Obama is. Yeah. Yet he, from a governance point of view, has been a terrible president from a governance point of view has by, he every, really? what, by what, every measure. What, why is he by every terrible? Measure. In what sense? Uh, because he passed a, uh, an, the largest entitlement since Medicare uh, in a straight party line vote. The Obamacare. Without, Obamacare without without uh, developing a bipartisan consensus, which has never been done before. That's bad governance. That's Republicans, bad leadership. Republicans, you know, didn't want to do that. You know that. But the but the I'm trying the to make a point Republicans said here. at the beginning that what was it? Who, what's his name? The uh, the leader in the in the House. No, not John the, Boehner. No, not not Boehner. The other guy in the Senate, I think. The, the minority. Mitch leader. McConnell. Yeah, McConnell said the first thing we want to do here at the beginning of Obama's presidency is we got to make sure he's a one-term president. Well, that's of course what every person of the other no, party is wants to do. Holding a hand out and saying, that, "I want to work that, with but you," you're, you're missing and then the, you blame the large, Obama because the larger he point. Work with the larger point I'm making, however, is that President Obama was an excellent campaigner, not been a very good president in terms of the economic results, aside from whatever one's party mm -hmm. affiliation. What's the unemployment rate so the, the, now? The, What's the unemployment rate? Now? Uh, I think you said earlier, eight point uh, eight point one percent. Eight point one percent. Right. And what was it when he came but in how, as president? Uh, I don't recall exactly, but the more the more important. Weren't we hemorrhaging hundreds of thousands of jobs when he came in? We were losing all those jobs. Now we're gaining jobs. We have up to ten percent. The, the, We've come back to eight percent. Let me know when you're we done. Had, okay, but we had this major, <laughs> major uh, crash no in question. the economy. Okay, Bush presided over that. It was the the policy that emerged out of that was the Bush, Bernanke, Obama policy. Oh, anytime, okay? I'm ready. Okay, and then since then, and since then, the economy has slowly but surely come back. It's been the worst. Unemployment has gone the worst back down. Jeff, it's been the worst recovery since World War II. Let me finish this thought. It's been the worst recovery since World War II. If all the people who were in the job market 
at the time that Obama came into office, where in the job market today, unemployment would be over 11 percent. The reason it's only 8.1 percent is because so many people are so fed up with the lack of jobs as they've quit looking for work. We have the lowest employment participation rate in this country since 1981. So from on a jobs basis, this president is an utter failure despite the 8.1 percent. As I say, it would be 11 percent if not for the job participation rate. So you folks should know how facile I am because I argued John Tillman's point of view in the Chicago Tribune. Look it up in June. It's in the print column. So you'll see Berkowitz and Zorin go point, counterpoint. But this is my job, John. I just want you to understand. I know it's your job. I get what you're doing. My job is to challenge you. You understand I that? get what you're doing, but you've got to let me return the volley. But I did. I did. Anything, okay, <laughs> anything that I didn't let you say you want to say? No, let's move on to something else. That All was right. fun. So let's just finish up the, the pension thing, and then we'll go to education, okay? All right. So the thing is on pensions, you know, there are some people who are saying we are moving toward reform. We, the, the Quinn policy, he said, was to was to increase the retirement age, increase the employee contributions, modify the COLA. Okay? If you did that and did it as Quinn said, he would say you might chop off the, if you were $83 billion underfunded, do all of those things, you'd get 60 to $70 billion of that funding problem cured. Now some people in your organization have said on this show that it's not $83 billion underfunded, it's more like $200 billion. Mm -hmm. But still you would have something and we were marching in that way and Mike Madigan put in the poison pill of the cost shift and John, you supported Madigan on that. You supported the cost shift. Uh, well, first of all, so politically, as, as, did you do the wrong thing? Well, first of all, you helped Jeff, Mike stop that reform. Jeff, now we, you can. We, now did, you're we did not. We did not support Mike Madigan on the cost shift. We supported a good policy, which is that you should have vertical accountability in pensions, which means local governments, particularly local school districts should be accountable for their own pension costs, not the state's taxpayers. The fact that Mike Madigan happened to agree with us on this is a wonderful thing. So did President Cullerton and so did Governor Quinn. And of course the reasons for this is because most of the suburban school districts are voting Republican and the reason the Republicans thus oppose mm -hmm. this policy is because most of the suburban school districts vote Republican. But the bottom line on this is that every unit of okay. government should be accountable for their own pension costs, not the state's taxpayers. And if we were starting de novo, Dan Proft, who's a senior fellow at the Illinois mm -hmm. Policy Institute, and you know Dan, Ranford, I know Dan well, he's a good friend. You respect him? He's of a good course, friend. he's a good friend, yeah. Dan said you shouldn't have the cost shift. He said if you're, on this show, he said if you're going to have reform, of the type you're talking about, which he favors, and do everything, school choice, reform the funding, et cetera, et cetera. Don't just do this little tweak. Well, who said that? Nobody said that. No, I've not, I've certainly not said that. But that's what it comes off on, because you're supporting, Repu you're supporting Madigan. No. Who's See, putting the, you're not supporting Madigan. You're supporting, you and Madigan agree for different reasons. And I understand, you articulate a very sound reason for the accountability, for that cost shift. But let me be, let me and Madigan, act, you okay. pointed out, does it for political but reasons. But Jeff, let me actually address the question because okay. now you are misrepresenting our position and I want to make sure. sure. No, okay. you are. Okay. Uh, our position is to oppose a cost shift if that is a standalone or a part of an underperforming uh, uh, policy reform. We would oppose a cost shift. Oh, I see. We would support a cost shift as part of a macro reform program that would essentially convert public employee pensions to a 401k style program. Okay. With some, and we would be willing to accept some hybrid and if there is some hybrid, there should be local okay. pension accountability. But we have all along opposed a standalone cost shift. And so people who actually read our stuff and pay attention to what we actually say, as opposed to what other people say about our policies, would okay. know that. No, and I apologize. And I think that's a good correction. I didn't realize that. And I have asked people that. And, I, we've said it repeatedly okay. and loudly, but some people use the fact that we've been supportive of the cost shift as a part of a package uh, for their own purposes. And I'm sure you're surprised to hear that people might use it for their no, own but purposes. You, so you would have game. liked to see those reforms that I mentioned go along. Increase in the retirement age, increase in the employee contribution, modification of the COLA. That is, right now, it's not doesn't all reflect those, the cost. All of those are essential, but the most important thing is to migrate current employees off of the defined benefit program, what people call the DB program. Mm -hmm. We actually call it the dead broke program, okay. uh, into a four hundred one k style program. So the so the last thing, and then we'll we'll, we'll have our own shift, not a cost shift, we'll have a shift <laughs> over education. But the last thing on that, so you would have you would have supported those reforms, and if you couldn't go toward a four hundred one k, you might. Your organization, if you were involved in this, might have made the political judgment, okay, let the Republicans, I understand why the Republicans can't support the cost shift, we're not doing total reform, take what you can, and if you can't get it, just run on that. Well, if just I, run, to advise the Republicans, say the Democrats didn't do this, they put in this poison pill, we're with you folks, run on that, get a Republican House, Republican State Senate, and then go toward a 401k. 
Am yeah, I with you? Did more, I, did more, I get that right? More, more or, or less. less. There's more okay. to that, but uh, we'll, well, let's go that. On. we'll Let's go on. Let's go on to education because this is really key. I mean, I think this is perhaps the most important thing that your organization does. Would you say school choice, school well, I think any time you're talking about the future of children who are locked into a Berlin-like wall educational system that prevents children in the city of Chicago and failing school systems around this state from getting the kind of education that they're entitled to because the teachers unions, and in this case the Chicago teachers unions, really put the kids at the back of the line and put their self-interest at the front of the line, yeah, that's pretty important. And what was it, would you say, that was the best example you could point to of the Chicago Teachers Union putting kids at the back of the line. The best example in this in this strike, in number, this negotiation. Num number one, walking out on the children and going on strike, that's the easiest one. But beyond that, once that was done, it's the fact that they, their entire negotiating posture was to avoid accountability for their teaching performance. And the most shameful thing they did was imply that they can't be held accountable because some of these kids come out of broken homes, bad family situations, rough neighborhoods, and all the rest of it. It's a great outrage that they would try to excuse their poor performance and not let us identify, not let the mayor identify great teachers in that system. The whole point of the mayor's agenda, where I agree with him on this, and that certainly has been our point of view, is that there are some teachers in the Chicago public school system who are brilliantly helping kids, no matter where they come from, no matter who they are, no matter the difficulties. There are some teachers that move them farther faster. The mayor and people like us want to identify those great teachers, reward them better, and learn from them how to expand that and repeat that over time. At the same time, what the reformers want to do is identify the poor teachers who are hurting kids and those teachers who should not be in front of those classrooms. Hurting kids year after year, generation after generation. And what this teachers union said was, we don't want that. We do not want to be held accountable. In fact, we deny your right to even hold us accountable because these kids have come from too tough a homes and their entire negotiating posture was to water it well, down. I think fair. it's an they outrage. Did, they didn't quite use the words they said. I mean, I might agree with the thrust of where you're going, as you know. But again, my job here isn't to say whether I agree or disagree. Right. It's the challenge. And in, in the unions really didn't use those words. What they said is, we don't want to use standardized tests, which are a poor means of assessing the contribution we are that making. That is all code for avoiding students. accountability. That's all that is. It's code for avoiding accountability. You think so? It, absolutely. So and you have faith in the standardized test look, here's as the, a measure here's, of teacher here's my performance. Challenge, here's my challenge to Karen Lewis in the Chicago Teachers Union. If you don't think standardized tests are a good tool to measure your teacher's performance, why don't you start advocating for opportunity scholarship vouchers so kids can go to any independent school they want, let the money follow the children, let's empower the parents instead of having Karen Lewis have all the power. Let's open up charters and take the cap off charter schools and let's see how other teachers in an open competition do against your CTU teachers. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I think we'd find that all the teachers she would She says better. the charter schools, it's unfair because they're not assessed, they're not evaluated in the same way that the public schools are. Uh, Does nine, she have a point? No, she doesn't, as usual. Nine of the top 10 uh, public high, uh, open enrollment uh, high schools in the city of Chicago are charter schools. Nine of the top 10. The, uh, the, to, uh, the um, top charter schools had an average uh, ACT score of 20.8, which is an outstanding effort. Mm -hmm. So by every measure, uh, the charter schools are doing quite well, and we think they could do better with more Do the support. charter schools, do they, do they identify and provide services to special ed kids? Uh, charter schools have to take all comers, all enrollees, uh, and it's an open... You mean by lottery? By lottery, right. So, and if so they find somebody who's special ed, what do they do? Because they don't have the resources to handle that special ed kid. No, I think they? those kids, the special ed kids probably stay in the Chicago public school system. I'm not as familiar with that. Well, isn't that one reason why your test scores might be higher? Because if the, no, we're comparing if the special apples, ed kids no, stay in these no, other schools. No, those, they, those kids are not part of the same pool we're comparing to. Oh. Comparing so to. when you said nine of top nine of the top nine ten, of the top ten open enrollment schools are charter schools. The other in the, city of the other open enrollment. These are open enrollment traditional high schools, right? No, but you're right. okay. So nine of the ten open enrollment. No, we're not schools. we're not comparing kids who have special ed to uh, the broad population. No. Are these like magnet schools, or they're not magnet schools? Open enrollment the, by definition is not a magnet, magnet school. Magnet school, okay. Right. So you're comparing basically comparing to the the other neighborhood schools, but are these open enrollment schools? Where these open enrollment traditional public schools to which you're making the comparison, did they provide special ed services? I don't know the answer. See, because question. the answer is, if I think they do, and if they do, wouldn't your sample be rather skewed? Because the special ed kids, they may get more time, they may get an accommodation, but, but on, on average, they I think perform less well than the not special ed kids. So I, does I, again, does Karen Lewis have a point when she says she no, says because your I data, don't, I your don't, data are no, deficient? No, because I think the entire premise you just laid out there is false, and I would have to look at it when we're not on the show. Okay. I, but I don't think that is correct. What you've just said. 
Okay. Well, we can come back to that. But so, but the whole debate, the whole debate, or much of the debate on the on between the CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union, mm -hmm. and the CPS, Chicago Public School System, was on the CPS's desire to do what you want to do. So you're in sync with Ron on this, which is he wanted to he wanted to use student standardized tests to as assess one, as, one the, part. as one as part, one part to assess the improvement. So you know, it's not as Lewis might say, well, you can't expect us to do as well as the kids do in your trier. Right. We want to know, Karen, did the kids improve over the last year? Exactly. So if they went from reading at, if they were in fifth grade and they went from reading at third grade to reading at fourth grade, there's improvement. Right. You want to okay. identify those teachers who move kids from what, the beginning of the year to the end of the year better than other teachers, reward those teachers, learn from those teachers, replicate what those teachers do. And the union's entire game plan was to avoid the kind of measurement and evaluation process that would allow that to happen. <laughs> And the debate was over the percentage, the weight of that. It was just one. And I think they came up with the agreed, I think the contract, well, I haven't read the whole thing, or any of it, actually, to be fair. But I think the contract says there'll be 30, 30 to 35 they percent to, they of the, the evaluation can use this standardized test, improvement in standardized tests. I guess maybe Ron would have liked 50 or 60 percent. Lewis might have liked 10 percent. They compromised. Uh, would you say, would you say, number one, that Rom got something there because he got more use of standardized tests to assess improvement? That was state law. They had no choice in that in the first place. And the, the contract but the that number, was passed, the percentage was in state the, law. That was to left to be left to the students. No, there's so a speak. minimum. There's a minimum in state law, I believe. I believe there was a minimum. All right. Okay. And the other thing was about principals being able to, you know, choose who their teachers would be. It's all been watered down. The proof will be in the pudding. We will see whether or not Rom retained any control over principals hiring right. and whether or not uh, the, okay. or the unions are able to water it down. My fear is the unions will be able to water it down. They've stated that's what they want to do. So, but you should in a sense be happy because really what we need is a great train wreck, people would say. Let's get this over with. Let's let the CPS become terrible, terrible, terrible. And then we could shift over. Rom could be, have the political will and power to close the non-performing schools and replace them with charter schools. You would prefer school vouchers, but you would probably say charter schools get you halfway I'm an, there. I'm an all the above. There, right? I'm an all the above kind of person. Okay. I think we should have all the tools. But the tragedy of what you just laid out there is that there are 400,000 kids who are basically being ground up in a Chicago public school system that is failing. While these two parties, remember, there's a very important thing here that we haven't said yet. The Chicago public school system is a monopoly provider of educational services to those 350,000 kids, 83% of whom are low income. Because of the CTU, oh, go ahead, go ahead. The CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union, is a monopoly provider of the labor. The whole point is in these negotiations, they both got more or less what they wanted. Rom got a settlement, which is what he was out for from the very beginning, and Karen Lewis got some things that she wanted and, and warded off accountability. The bottom line is the kids are still in a failing system, marginal improvement, and uh, the, this, the only way to change it is by empowering parents, which you've long been an advocate of. We're going to continue to speak as the credits roll, but I very much want to thank Can't our possibly guys. have been John 30 Tillman, minutes. Thank you so much. He, you heard it first. He's not running for governor in 2014, but John, how about 2018? You know, that's a long ways off. Okay, he's left the door open. You heard it first on Public Affairs. <laughs> Not in 2014, but maybe in 2018. Yeah, Thank you so much, John, for coming just very what I seriously. Said. He's a great guy. Folks, you should get to know more about the Illinois Policy Institute. They can go to IllinoisPolicy.org, right? That's right. You've got events coming up all the time. Great events all the You're time. You're a fair organization. You like to see a variety of ideas discussed. Mm -hmm. You welcome dissent, all Absolutely. those things. Absolutely. Clearly, that's why I'm here. But yes, but uh, you know, John, I mean, we, we treat you reasonably well. Absolutely. We give you a chance to express your viewpoints. Right? Most of the time. Most of the time. But you come down to this. It's your, this is what your organization is about, economic liberty. You believe in freedom. You believe in competition. You believe in these things as producing a more efficient outcome. Why won't they let these kids leave failing schools? 400,000 students? No, not all of them are failing, but maybe 200,000 are in failing schools. Let them go. And then they can say, thank God Almighty, thank God Almighty, free at last, free at last, or is it reverse? But you know the point. Yes. These folks are, Karen Lewis is standing in the door and saying they can't go out. Just no. like Orville It's a Berlin Fobbes. Wall. It's a Berlin Wall. They're locked in. And how would they be hurt? Eric Zorn says, oh, he's not sure. If you look at all this stuff here, you look at uh, School of Choice by Herb Wahlberg and the findings, he says, Jeff, if you really get dig into these studies, not clear the charter schools outperform traditional public schools. What do you say to Eric Zorn? I'd say he's wrong. You've looked at the studies. I've looked at the studies. You would debate him any day, any time of the week.